Good morning. <laughs> oh, nice. Uh, so this presentation uh, grew out of a critique I wrote for Psychology Today of the Eat Lancet report, which came out in January of this year. And it's essentially a document which seeks to control the way all of us eat. Uh, so, but before we get started, just to disclose, which I think everyone in, uh, invested in nutrition should disclose their biases and conflicts of interest. I have no financial conflicts of interest, but a girl can dream. Um, I am not funded by the meat industry, even though I am convinced by the science that meat, seafood, and poultry belong in a healthy diet. So this report, um, of 47 pages, is entitled Food in the Anthropocene, uh, the Eat Lancet Commission on Healthy Diets. So its lead author was Professor Walter Willett of Harvard School of Public Health, and it envisions a great food transformation which seeks to um, feed a growing global population a diet, uh, a healthy diet that uh, will do minimal damage to the planet. So that's what we all want. We all want that. This is really, really important for us to understand this document. Um, but before we can do that, we have to first understand what is EAT, what is Lancet, and what in the world is the Anthropocene? So EAT is uh, a nonprofit startup dedicated to transforming our global food system through sound science, impatient disruption, and novel partnerships. The Lancet is one of the world's oldest and most respected medical journals, and it commissioned this report. The Anthropocene, if you ask me, is a pretentious word laid out as an unwelcome mat, basically to say, don't bother trying to understand what's in this report. You won't understand it. Let us just explain it to you. We'll tell you what to do. Um, but if, like me, you didn't know what this word meant, um, this is the definition, the current geological age, viewed as the period during which human activity has been the dominant influence on climate and the environment. So what does Eat Lancet propose we do about this predicament in which we may have some negative impacts on our, on our environment? Um, this is their great food transformation, and its cornerstone is the minimization of or complete elimination of all animal foods. Um, in this diet, it's, uh, it's okay to eat zero grams of all animal foods if you wish, um, but if you do choose to include some animal foods in your diet, you may have up to three ounces uh, combined of all animal foods, uh, so meat, seafood, poultry, etc. cetera, um, and uh, when it comes to red meat in particular, you are allowed seven grams per day, <laughs> or one quarter of an ounce. So, uh, according to Lancet, if you eat more than two of these bad boys, you've shaved years off your life. Um, so, after this proclamation was issued, there was a worldwide media blitz, and articles are still being published every single day. Uh, and, and most of these articles essentially echo the main message of the report without scrutinizing its contents. And that's a real mistake because this report is not your average nutrition study to be debunked. Um, this is actually a grand master plan uh, for, to control the way all of the earthlings eat. So, a quote, the scale of change to the food system is unlikely to be successful if left to the individual or the whim of consumer choice. And, and they intend to use every lever of power available to them to implement their, uh, their, their mission. Um, quote, by contrast, hard policy interventions include laws, fiscal measures, subsidies and penalties, trade configuration, and other economic and structural measures. So, so that's what impatient disruption means to them. So regardless of whether or not you eat meat or whether you're low carb or high carb, a document this authoritarian really deserves our attention. So if you just look at the cover of the report or just read the media headlines, you will be left with this impression that meat is a dangerous, dangerous for the environment, dangerous for our health. But if you dare to open this report, what you actually find is uh, an airtight case for meat as an essential component of a healthy diet. Surprise! So one of the foundations of Eat Lancet is supposed to be sound science. So what kind of science did the commission use? 
Well, there are lots of different types of evidence to choose from, and, and they did use various kinds. Um, most scientists would say that uh, experimental evidence where you're actually changing someone's diet and then seeing what happens, that that may be a better type of evidence than epidemiological evidence, which Rob just did a beautiful job of describing. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so most people think that randomized controlled trials, or RCTs, are a superior form of evidence to some other types of evidence. Now, RCTs have their problems too. They're not perfect. No, no study is perfect. But um, the, the Eat Lancet Commission is biased heavily towards epidemiological studies. And epidemiological studies are not experiments. They do not change uh, foods and find out what happens. Instead, um, they administer these food frequency questionnaires, or FFQs, to people, and they gather the answers, and then they look for patterns in the answers to try to guess what types of foods cause what types of diseases. Now, these uh, types of studies have been uh, increasingly discredited by very reputable scientists, um, but yet they still form the lion's share of nutrition studies that we see in the headlines. And uh, they, th this particular methodology, as it applies to nutrition, was essentially invented by Professor Walter Willett, the lead author of this report. So, um, these food frequency questionnaires uh, deserve to be exposed. <laughs> so here is an actual question from an actual food frequency questionnaire. Over the past 12 months, how often did you drink milk as a beverage, not in coffee, not in cereal? Please include chocolate milk and hot chocolate. So you, know, you can choose you know, once a month or less, two to three times a day, five, six times a week. Um, and then what kind of milk did you usually drink? You have to remember what percent. So how many of you could answer this question easily? Um, most people can't remember what they ate, they, ate, they ate three days ago, let alone 12 months ago. And notice what's missing here. You're not allowed to say, I don't know, I don't remember. Or you're not allowed to say, I gave up milk in a dairy in August. Or, you know, um, you're not allowed to say, you've got to be kidding me. So these are the kinds of, excuse me, these are the kinds of studies, these are the kinds of data. Your answers become the data, your guesses, your wild guesses become the data um, that these scientific um, studies are based on. And furthermore, you know, this particular food frequency questionnaire contains 66 questions, and some of them contain a few more than that. But the typical modern diet contains thousands of ingredients. It's really impossible to imagine being able to construct a questionnaire capable of capturing that kind of complexity. So I would argue, not that some epi studies give weak results or the associations aren't, aren't strong enough or this or that, but okay, there's no data to begin with. These studies should not be used to form public policy. They can be used to generate hypotheses, guesses, when they're very well constructed, guesses about which foods might cause which diseases, and then those need to be um, tested in clinical trials. But you know, one of the other things that happens with uh, you know, looking at scientific studies is we ignore all of the other kinds of evidence available. And, and this is where I spend a lot of my time, is reading about other types of science to try to figure out what's going on, because you can't rely on epidemiology. And so the vast majority of the time, the hypotheses, the guesses that people who use this kind of methodology, um, the guesses that they come up with fly in the face of biology and fly in the face of every other type of evidence available. This is why I think nutrition epidemiology is really mythology. Um, because when, when they actually get around to testing these guesses in clinical trials, they're wrong more than 80% of the time. So you would actually be better off flipping a coin to guess which foods cause which diseases. Does that sound scientific to you? So, you know, we are going to have to crack open this report and look and see what's inside. And, and I think you'll, you know, we, we need to look at the different ways, some examples in their own words of how the authors could twist pro-meat science into anti-meat recommendations. This will be a lot of fun. So what do they think about protein? Um, well, there were some nutrition epidemiological studies that found that red meat increased the risk of death um, when those studies were conducted in the US and when they were conducted in Europe. But the epi studies from Asia 
found that red meat, especially pork, did not increase the risk of death. So what do you do when your favorite methodology comes out with two different answers? Well, you dismiss the answer you don't like. And you say, huh, um, maybe the risk didn't show up in Asians because they, ha this is literally what they said, they haven't been rich long enough to afford meat for long enough for the risk to show up yet. So, you know, not true. Um, very interesting. Now, they have an entire section in the report dedicated to red meat, and they blame it for everything from heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, obesity, cancer, and early death. Um, and they list 16 references in this section, and every single one is an epidemiological study. But meanwhile, in sub-Saharan Africa, the real world, quote, growing children often do not obtain adequate nutrients from plant source foods alone. Promotion of animal source foods for children, including livestock products, can improve dietary quality, micronutrient intake, nutrient status, and overall health. That's a quote from the report. So, red meat uh, in, on planet epidemiology is an apocalypse on a plate. Um, how did they come up with these specific numbers, seven grams of this and 31 grams of that? Well, um, they acknowledge that there's some wiggle room there. They say, we have a high level of scientific certainty about the overall direction and magnitude of the associations, although considerable uncertainty exists around detailed quantifications. Quote, since consumption of poultry has been associated with better health outcomes than has red meat, we have concluded that the optimum consumption of poultry is zero grams per day to about 58 grams per day. It's the illusion of precision. They actually have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> so they're conflicted about poultry. What do they think about eggs? Well, um, to their credit, they think eggs are nutritious. Quote, eggs are a widely available source of high quality protein and other essential nutrients needed to support rapid growth. In large prospective epi studies, high consumption of eggs, up to one a day, has has not been associated with increased risk of heart disease, except in people with diabetes. However, in low-income countries, replacing calories from a staple starchy food with an egg can substantially improve the nutritional quality of a child's diet and reduce stunting, randomized control trial. So how much eggs do they recommend? We've used an intake of eggs at about one, uh, 13 grams per day, or about one and a half eggs per week for the reference diet but higher intake might be beneficial for low-income populations with poor dietary quality. Why recommend one and a half eggs per week when your own epidemiological studies say that up to seven eggs per week is fine? And if you're worried about the people with diabetes, why not just say, except in people with diabetes? And that might actually make sense, except for these six randomized controlled trials showing specifically that eggs in people with diabetes are perfectly safe. Now, this did not make it somehow into the report. I, maybe they didn't have enough room to include it. I don't know. So, um, what are they, so, you know, they're not really fans of, of red meat, poultry, eggs. How do they feel about protein in general? Protein quality reflects amino acid composition, and animal sources of protein are of higher quality than most plant sources. I completely agree. High-quality protein is particularly important for growth of infants and young children, and possibly in older people, losing muscle mass in later life. However, a mix of amino acids that maximally stimulate cell replication and growth might not be optimal throughout most of adult life because rapid cell replication can increase cancer risk. Translation, complete Proteins are good because they're, they're healthy and essential and only animal proteins are complete and plant pro most plant proteins are incomplete, so complete proteins are good. But complete proteins are bad because they cause cancer. <laughs> and, you know, I've heard every anti-meat argument there is, every, every, every meat causes cancer argument there is, but I've never heard this one. So I wanted to know where they got that information. It was a single source cited, and it was this paper, which is, has, um, it's a paper about the cell mutation theory of cancer, that mutations cause cancer. And in that report, the words protein, amino acid, and meat show up a grand total of zero times. This paper is not about protein of any kind, meaty or otherwise, causing cancer. 
So the, the, the commissioners, to their credit, repeatedly acknowledge that animal foods are inferior sources of nutrients compared to plant foods, that it's harder to get your nutrients from a plant-based diet. In pregnant women, they say, inclusion of some animal source foods in maternal diets is widely considered important for fetal growth, increased iron requirement, um, especially during third trimester. Evidence suggests that balanced vegetarian diets can support healthy fetal development with the caveat that strict vegan diets require supplements of B12. And in adolescent women, young girls, uh, teenagers, adolescent girls are at risk of iron deficiency because of rapid growth combined with menstrual losses. Menstrual losses have sometimes been a rationale for increased consumption of red meat. But multivitamin or multimineral preparation provide an alternative that is less expensive without the adverse consequences of high red meat intake. Now, if you really believe that red meat um, you know, is, uh, is dangerous, uh, has adverse consequences, which is only true on planet epidemiology, why not recommend to these young women a different type of animal food, like oysters or chicken liver or duck? So in changing to their diet, the commission claims that the adequacy of most micronutrients increases, including several essential ones, iron, zinc, folate, vitamin A, as well as calcium. The only exception is vitamin B12, that is low in animal-based diets. Supplementation of fortification with B12 uh, and possibly B2 might be necessary in some circumstances. So um, this statement really downplays the nutrient deficiency risks of plant-based diets. Um, not only um, do uh, the iron, zinc, and vitamin A come in the wrong forms in plant foods and they're harder for us to use, um, but uh, you know the, the plant-based diets are missing other uh, nutrients as well, vitamin K2, the, 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 the uh, correct form of omega-3s. So um, I think that they don't really understand that you have to also look at bioavailability, not just, just because a, a, a food contains a nutrient does not mean necessarily that you can access it well. So, um, but you know, essentially they're just saying, their argument is, um, yes, we know that maybe our diets are less, you know, less good at giving you nutrients, but just, just take supplements. But you know, this vitamin B12 is a, is a major issue. Um, it's really, I think, our best argument uh, for explaining to anybody why we can say for, for sure that our ancestors, all of them, ate animal foods, because, at least until the 1950s when B12 supplements were invented. You just couldn't have survived on a diet without animal foods prior to that time. So what did they think about fat? Well, the essential ones they like. Um, Omega-3s are essential. Fish has a high content of omega-3 fatty acids, which have many essential roles. Adequate intakes are essential for neurodevelopment. Eating more than two servings of fish per week or taking fish oil supplements during pregnancy associated with improved child cognitive performance. So omega-3s, good. Plant sources of alpha linoleic acid, sorry, linolenic acid, ALA, can provide an alternative to omega-3 fatty acids, but the quantity required is not clear. Well, the reason for that is this elephant in the room is that all omega-3s are not created equal. Um, you have, um, in plants and animals, you have an omega-3 called ALA. Um, but the, the kinds of omega-3s our bodies need are EPA and DHA. And it's very, very difficult for us to convert ALA into the EPA and DHA our bodies need, in some studies as low as 0%. So what they're basically saying in their recommendations is, this is, this is their final, but about 28 grams per day or one ounce of fish can provide essential omega-3 fatty acids. Therefore, we have used this intake for the reference diet. We also suggest a range of zero to 100 grams per day because high intakes are associated with excellent health. It's just you can't make this up. <laughs> So basically, um, that's how they feel about essential fatty acids. How do they feel about all of the other types of fat, including saturated fat? Well, evidence from prospective cohort epi studies and randomized trials, the Women's Health Initiative, has not suggested a benefit of reducing total fat intake. Translation, fat's fine, eat as much as you want. But wait, that would mean saturated fat is fine too. Oh, we can't, oh, we can't have that. 
let's, let's do something here. Um, epidemiological evidence supports a substantial re uh, reduced risk of cardiovascular disease by replacing saturated fat with unsaturated vegetable oils, especially those high in PUFAs that include omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. Now, just a minute. This is an epidemiological study. Nobody replaced anything with anything. This was not an experiment. This replacement of saturated fat with unsaturated only happened in their imagination. So they go on to require that everybody have at least one and a half tablespoons, up to six tablespoons of unsaturated oil per day, divided equally between olive, soy, canola, sunflower, and peanut. So essentially, the majority of your fat intake should come from highly processed, industrially produced oils, very high in pro-inflammatory omega-6 fatty acids, and uh, containing the wrong form of omega-3s. How about carbohydrates, their favorite macronutrient? So to their credit, they do acknowledge that insulin resistance exists. In controlled feeding studies, high carbohydrate intake increases blood triglyceride concentrations, reduces HDL, the so-called good cholesterol, and increases blood pressure, especially in people with insulin resistance. In a large controlled feeding trial, replacing carbohydrate isocalorically with protein reduced blood pressure and blood lipid concentration. So that was actually the OmniHeart trial, which used a 50-50 mix of plant and animal protein. Um, and they lowered the carbohydrate in the diet from 58% to 48% of calories per day. Um, the, uh, the commission then goes on to simply ig ignore concerns about carbohydrate, <clears throat> recommends a very high carbohydrate uh, diet, and thanks to um, Dr. Zoe Harcom for this information, 330 grams of carb per day on average is what they recommend. 51% uh, of calories, they really don't say what you should do if you have insulin resistance, so just don't worry about it. Um, you know, and, and they say that this diet is um, appropriate, it's intended for all healthy people over the age of two. But the problem is most of us aren't healthy anymore. In a recent study, um, I mean, this is true all over the world, but in a recent study, uh, it's been uh, estimated that only one in eight Americans um, are metabolically healthy now. So this diet, this high carbohydrate diet, is dangerous for the vast majority of us. Um, they, while they never come right out and say this, it, there's a drumbeat in the background as you're reading it that, uh, that the, the less animal foods you eat, the better, the more plants you eat, the better, and it's even okay just to completely remove all animal foods for your diet. But the problem is, throughout the report, they acknowledge that their diet is insufficient for uh, pregnant women, for babies, for growing children, for, um, for teenage women, for um, uh, aging adults, uh, for the malnourished and the impoverished. And it's inappropriate for everybody with insulin resistance. So, um, ev and everybody else has to supplement. So they're basically saying that their diet is insufficient or inappropriate for everyone, full stop. Um, so then why is it that so many people continue to, uh, more and more, it's becoming more and more popular, more and more people are adopting plant-based diets every day. That's the, that's, it's, it, it's really interesting. And so that's why, uh, you know, I, I welcome to what I'm calling the misanthropocene. The misanthropocene is uh, the era of, of species self-hatred. You know, we feel bad, we feel guilty, we, we, we think that we're damaging the planet with every, every uh, f uh, fork of food we're, we're taking in um, because we, th we think it's bad for animals, we think it's bad for the planet. Um, and uh, we, I understand the, this emotional argument. So the question is, um, you know, I'm convinced that their nutritional recommendations are not based on anything worthwhile, in fact, maybe dangerous, but what about the sustainability argument? Now, um, I am not qualified in any way, shape, or form to uh, comment on sustainability. Um, so I'll just show you a couple of really quick things. Um, this is uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Frank Mitloner of UC Davis for pointing this out to me in this section of the report. This is just one strip of, uh, this comes from table six in the report. And uh, bear with me here for a second. Across the top, you see all the different types of environmental um, outcomes that they were looking at. And then down there on the left, you see three different diets. Uh, the BAU diet, or business as usual, um, their recommended reference, their average uh, intake uh, diet that they're recommending, their reference diet. And then a vegan diet on the bottom. So you can, and you know, red is bad for the environment, yellow is a little better, and green is the best. So you can see way over on the left, under greenhouse gases, 
the, the vegan diet they are projecting would be better for the planet based on all kinds of really complicated things. Um, so uh, I didn't know how to assess this, but um, Dr. Mitloner um, did, um, did take a look at, and, and oh, I wanna show you one more thing. That's the entire table right there, uh, modified so you can really focus on things. So as they made, as you go down this table, it's the same strip, but just each time they're making the uh, production and waste management measures more and more strict to try to, to, try to really get, uh, try to really improve the environment. So as you see, as you go down the table, most of these blocks are still a solid color, which means, except over on the left-hand left -hand side, really, most of these uh, environmental outcomes, except greenhouse gases, do not improve under even a vegan diet. So Dr. Mitloner wrote to Eat Lancet to inquire about how the greenhouse gas emissions were calculated, and he received this remarkable reply from the science director of Eat Lancet. Uh, quote, the meat consumption limits proposed by the commission were not set due to environmental considerations, but were solely in light of health recommendations. Thus, is not the diet to reduce climate change, but the diet to reduce the risk of premature mortality due to dietary-related health causes. So, if by their own acknowledgement, this diet is not um, uh, the one that's intended to, to help the planet, and by our, hopeful, hopefully, uh, uh, hopefully we agree that it's not better for health, um, what is it really about? Um, so this sustainability issue, I would want to call your attention. I, I, I didn't realize, I apologize, I didn't realize that, that Diana Rogers would be here in the audience. Please consult her for her point of view. Nicolet Hahn Nyman's excellent book. Um, uh, Dr. Frank Mitloner at UC Davis. Peter Ballerstedt, who's here, a forage agronomist. And uh, Erica Hover, who's also here, she's a sustainability advisor with many, many years of experience. So please seek out different points of view uh, on this topic. So um, again, if, it, if, it's not, if it's not for people and the planet, um, who is this uh, report really for? Well, remember those novel partnerships we talked about? Um, in January, uh, a couple of years ago, of 2017, EAT co-launched Fresh, Food Reform for Sustainability and Health, a global partnership of many corporations, about 32 now. And um, you'll notice that um, about two-thirds of these companies produce things like fertilizers, pesticides, processed foods, flavorings, and additives. So you can make of that what you will. So, you know, I think it's really important for us to question authority. Um, you know, the Eat Lan Lancet report is a well orchestrated rallying cry to adopt a dangerously deficient planetary diet under the guise of compassion and responsibility and health. And it has what it takes to succeed. It has a unified appealing message. It has vast resources, powerful institutions and corporations behind it, and a seemingly virtuous benevolent agenda which wards off criticism. Whereas we, people who believe in using nutrition science um, to guide public health recommendations. Um, those of us in this community, the low-carb community, as well as other public health-minded communities around the world, um, we have diverse messages. We don't have centralized funding. We have independent voices. And we have a seemingly risky, controversial message which draws criticism. So, you know, there are many problems here. Um, I feel that Eat Lancet is trying to capitalize on fear, guilt, um, miseducation, and our addiction to processed foods. I mean, vegan diets come with serious risks. They require incredibly careful planning. Uh, they make people dependent on experts, supplements, and fortified foods, which by their nature must be processed um, because you can't fortify a whole food. So this plan is disempowering, uh, whereas those who profit from um, you know, those who profit from nutrition miseducation don't want you to know is that nutrition is really simple. It's really simple. Um, you eat whole foods, um, whole plants and animals. Avoid everything else. You know, tweak for your food sensitivities. Try low carb for insulin resistance or other strategies. Um, it's, really, um, it's really that simple. And I think that um, what we need to do, you know, we're kind of a we're kind of a herd of cats, you know? We're kind of a ragtag fugitive fleet. And I really hope that we can find a way to, um, to coordinate our efforts better because, you know, I, even though I ate meat, I care about animals. I care about the planet. I care about fellow human beings. I care about health. 
Um, you know, and I, I just think that, you know, feedlots and industrial crop production, they're not good for animals, they're not good for the planet, they're certainly not good for us. There just has to be another way forward. So thank you very much. <laughs>